Welcome everyone to the Deep Drive in the Left Field podcast. My name is Jack, otherwise known as MLB Nerds on Instagram, and I'm with my co-host Ryan Garcia, otherwise known as Yankee Stat Talk on YouTube, and Ryan Garcia ESM on Twitter. In today's uh, podcast, we're going to be talking about the Fernando Tatis Jr. extension, uh, how the Rays are ruining baseball, trivia, and our first base rankings. Uh, Another huge shout out to Relevant for sponsoring today's podcast. If you're looking for the best social media and networking app, Relevant is the place to be. Uh, I started a fantasy baseball league up on there. So if you are interested in that, click the link in my bio to join the MLB Nerds Fantasy Baseball Instagram, excuse me, Relevant uh, Vibe, and I will divide people in the leagues from there. Once again, thank you, Relevant, for sponsoring today's podcast, and let's get into it. As there's a drive in a deep left field by Castellanos, it will be a home run. Our first topic for today's podcast is going to be the Fernando Tatis Jr. extension. I'm sure as everyone heard, he signed a 14-year, $340 million extension uh, with San Diego Padres, which is going to pay him, I think, $24.5 million per season over the next 14 years. Uh, I'll get it started here. I think this is an incredible move for the Padres and Tatis. Tatis, obviously, you pretty much wipe out all of his arbitration years and one renewal year. And for the Padres, you get your star back at a very reasonable price if you think about it. Tatis is not going to flounder. He's he's not going to he's not going to be a bad player going forward. He might not, you know, sustain the the 150 WC plus type production he's going to put up uh, over the past two seasons, but uh, he'll definitely be worth the 24 million dollars per season. And that's not even including inflation. Uh, if you include inflation and regression, he is actually getting paid 4.5 million dollars per war on a 6.5 million dollars per war scale. Ryan, what are your thoughts on the signing in general? I think you would pretty much be in a similar boat as me but let's hear it anyways i'm curious what you have to say well i mean i 100 agree that's an i mean the padres i mean this is i think this might be one of their best moves of the offseason and like it was just an extension like most safe cases extensions good because like hey you locked up your guy but this was like an incredible extension think of what bets got i think that's got like what 10 years or how was it 12 years it was it was it was was 10 or more years yeah and he's he's like six or seven or six or seven years older than tatis tatis got 14 years if contract's gonna be over when he's 35 36 the padres are gonna basically have him until he's until like until he just starts regressing that's incredible anyone who thinks this is a bad contract because oh well what about 143 games the funny thing is with everyone when whenever someone brings that up they can never mention a a single player who's posted production at his level in, throughout their first 143 games, and they've never been able to name a player who's done that and then sucked for the rest of this, their career. People bring up guys like, oh, well, Bryce Harper won an MVP, and he was never the same. Never the same. The dude was a four-win player. So, like, your worst-case scenario is he Bryce Harper's, and he's never an MVP candidate again, but he's a four-win player every single year of his career. And, I mean, there's – I don't think the floor for Tatis is anything lower than a four-win player. At, on average, I really don't. I, I think that there's so much that would have to go wrong with Tatis. You would have to regress defensively, but he's a fast guy. So it would be hard for me to see his athletic, athleticism give way at the age of 22 or 23 and his defense start to slip. He would have to be a horrible hitter, which based on his bad and ball data would be extremely difficult for him to do. I think it's harder to imagine him being not worth his contract and being a bust than it is to imagine him being an MVP candidate every single year and posting a six F four every single year of his prime. I think that him being what he is right now consistently until he's like 32, 33 is way more likely than him being lower than like a four win player. He could literally be Trey Turner for the rest of his career and be more than worth it. I, that's how good he is. And that's how good this contract is. 24 million. That's like Patrick Corbin money. That's, it's a steal. And if you think otherwise, you're, you're not, you just don't know baseball. Just admit you don't know baseball. Yeah. I'm a bit surprised he didn't get a bit more because as our favorite reporter, Bob Nightingale tweeted, uh, Tatis after tax is going to be making about $169 million, $170 million over 14 seasons, which, you know, California usually end up paying a bit more than other places just because of that state tax. Besides the Stanton contract, that was a bit interesting because Florida is a significantly uh, less, obviously, state tax in California. And California is one of the higher ones. So uh, it's pretty interesting to see what he got and how much he's actually going to be getting. Uh, though the Potter is going to be paying that $304 million. Obviously, uh, taxes don't affect how much he's you know paying. So uh, it'll be interesting to see if Tatis gets any kind of raise. You know, if like in his prime, he's being ridiculous and inflation has his contract being like, the equivalent of you know, 10, $12 million at this point for his production. 
So we'll see how that goes. But I think both Ryan and I agree on the fact that this is an incredible contract for both the Padres. And I like it for Tatis as well. You get your money up front, even, you know, I, I guess he didn't really want to bet on himself. And I can't really blame him. If $340, $350 million is out for, there for the taking, this is without endorsements. Obviously, Tatis is going to be the face of baseball going forward. He's going to get plenty of endorsement deals. So uh, I think this is good for Tatis. He gets his $340 million now as opposed to waiting for later when he could have well, very, very well gotten more. Uh, but I, I just think this is good for both sides. Yeah, and I think also it shows that a lot of teams should start extending their players while they're young. Like, I, I tweeted this out, and I, I got some mixed reviews. The second the Tatis deal was finally announced, I said the Yankees should give Gleyber towards $240, $240 million for the next 12 years. Like, if they weren't trying to go – like, every team should be giving their players, their young stars, who they can project to at least to be worth that contract. They should be giving those guys – Large deals, long-term, low AAV, and you're going to be set. You're literally never going to have to worry about arbitration, never going to have to worry about, okay, how do I have to work around their next contract, their next arbitration case when we go into free agency? This is how you keep your stars. You don't wait until they're in free agency and, you know, then you got to figure out whether they want to stay or not. You know, that's what happened with bets. If the Red Sox extended bets early, I guarantee you, the, the, I, I mean, you would be in a much better situation as the Red, if you're the Red Sox in terms of your winning, right? I think they, if they were to go back and do it and they were to, as they're doing this rebuild process, if they get another player of that caliber and not maybe bets caliber, but of a star caliber, they're going to extend them early. This is going to be a trend now. And teams who do not get on this trend are going to be left behind. You're going to be giving up. You're going to be losing stars, losing free agents. Even if you're a big market team, oh, you're the Yankees. You have so much money. They're, they'll still walk away when someone else offers them more. Look at Rendon. He walked away from a World Series winning team. If the Nationals gave Rendon money earlier when he was underrated and he could have probably, they could have probably gotten away with underpaying him, they would have kept him. But same thing with bets. Same thing with all these other stars. The Nationals don't extend Soto. He's going to leave. I guarantee you that. The Nationals didn't give, do that to Bryce Harper. He left. The Angels did it with Trout. They extended him before he could hit free agency, and they're going to be able to keep him for a while. Now, they're incompetent, and they're going to struggle to uh, put together a World Series roster. Uh, but, you know, when you extend your stars early, you give them a boatload of money and say, this is guaranteed money. They're going to take it. They're going to run it. They're like 24, 25, 26, 27. They're not going to refute $300 million, $250 million. It's unrefutable, unrefutable money. Speaking of uh, teams underpaying their stars or not trying to pay their stars, the Tampa Bay Rays have uh, time and time again traded their star players for for uh, for prospects or what have you, either cut costs or you know trade them at their their highest possible value. So you know, for a team like the Rays who just traded obviously Blake Snell this off season, do you, do you think they should probably be interested in doing this as well, or you don't think they can even afford it? Like, do you think the Rays could go out and give Wander Franco ten years for one hundred twenty million dollars? One hundred. He's not going to take that, obviously, but something along those lines. You, you think they wouldn't? You think they'd do that if they could, or you think they should do that now, or what? Yeah, I would extend Franco right now. I'd give him a lose. For, you know how what the White Sox did with Robert, where they gave him money, and now Robert they bought out basically his entire arbitration, and they're going to be paying him ten million dollars regardless. They're never going to have to worry about arbitration, and he's one of the best defensive center fielders in baseball. And if he's just an above average hitter, he's a top five center fielder arguably in baseball. Uh, they, yeah, they should do that with Franco. But guess what? You're right. They're not going to do it because what they want to do is they want to sell to their fan base basically this idea, this product of. Well, okay, look, we'll give you one of the best analytical systems, if not the best analytical system in baseball. Some of the best, one of the best, if not the best GM in baseball. Uh, we'll, we'll sell you all these things. But uh, when I, the owner, feel as if I'm not making enough money because it's more, prof it's pr more profitable to put up a subpar product uh, and I know that I can be bailed out by my good front office that can be, they can make the Rays at least competitive. Uh, I can sell to my fan base that whatever I do, it's to be competitive. It's not to shed payroll. Don't, do not lie to yourself. Rays fans, Snell was a, it was a move to cut salary. Yes, they got good value. And Patino is going to be amazing. I love Patino. Or Pati is it Patino or Patino? Patino. Patino. Yeah. Uh, he's going to be amazing. But the only reason they made that move was because they wanted to save money. And Patino is not going to cost them money right now. They're going to be competitive. They're going to be a solid team. They're not going to be a World Series team. They're going to be solid. And by next year, I think they'll be a really, really good team. But every time your favorite player is going to hit arbitration, G-Man Choi is going to be gone soon. I guarantee you that. After this year, he'll be gone. Uh, Meadows will be gone in three years. Uh, and if they extend him, that means he will definitely be gone. The second they extend Glass now, which a lot of Rays fans want to happen, that's the death sentence. It, he will be gone within that contract salary. Uh, that's just how they are. 
uh, and they're bad for baseball. They're treating their fans terribly. And rather than using the analytics to be the best team in baseball, they're using their, an- they're using analytics to uh, increase the owner's uh, margin of, of profit rather than putting a better product on the field for their fans. Yeah, I kind of agree with you on that front. Uh, though I do think the Rays actually won the Snell trade themselves, but uh, I think the, the, the biggest reason was because of uh, salary uh, purposes and salary cutting purposes. They did get an insane return. And, you know, they as did. If, I was, if, if I was the fucking the Yankees and I had Blake Snell, I would do that 100% of the time. Even if the Yankees are contenders at that point in time, <gasps> Luis Patino, it, it, I understand this, Blake Snell, and, you know, it took me a minute to sort of, to, to sort of think about this. And I, I feel a bit bad about overrating Snell, but on my, my starters list, he doesn't throw many innings, even though the Rays fly. I mean, like somebody pointed out, I forgot exactly who it was. I think it was a uh, person on Instagram, MLB Mythbuster, go follow him, that Blake Snell, third time through the order, is like Nathan Evaldi. And you can't be an ace and, and, and be doing that, uh, especially if your team doesn't have that deep of a bullpen. Uh, though I think it might be a bit of an exaggeration to call him Nathan Evaldi, and especially through the third time in the order, that's not too bad. Um, I, I just think I, I'm a big fan of Luis Pino. I'm incredibly high on Luis Pino. Um, I think he's going to be incredible, especially with the Rays analytics uh, and pitching development. The uh, they don't have the gas station yet, but maybe they'll in, they'll invest in that. If you know what I'm talking about. Uh, cool. uh, yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah. So, uh, but my my main point is here: the Rays did sell very high, and they usually do that on players like Tommy Pham. They sell high on they sell the high on Emilio Pagan, uh, and though it might be to you know, make cost causing cost cutting measures. They're not, you know, getting away with, with just, you know, getting rid of their, their star players and, and giving away nothing, especially because, you know, guy, they're not trading like Nolan Arenado, who's on a pretty bad contract, no matter what way you slice it, it's an expensive contract and they got the Rockies got almost nothing in return. And that's sort of like what you expect. Um, <clears throat> but, and some people, unfortunately, like, you know, some of the biggest content creators uh, for major league baseball don't understand how, you know, contracts really work. Um, but w- w- my main point here, excuse me for rambling a bit, but my main point here is the race sell high and they buy low and that's how they're able to keep their payroll so low and compete, but it is bad for baseball because imagine if that, they imagine if they spend $125 million a year, imagine Oh, they'd be they're like what they're 50, 60 right now is their payroll less. Bro, three? If they kept the roster intact, I don't, don't even, you don't even have to, you, I think the, bl- I agree with you, like the tr- snow trade, like it, they got good value back, but the reason behind it, we all know was kind of to cut salary. And if they use the money they got from the Snell deal, cause they did cut a lot of payroll to improve the team, like get a better catcher, a guy like Tyler flowers, but they do like Tyler flowers. Still available. Um, I don't know yeah, no, he still is. I don't know why. I, I don't know. I used to feel like, feel like there's not much of a market for catchers. Perhaps, but like, you know what I'm saying? Like if they went out and they made moves to like, I, I like, I like the McHugh signing. I like the Hill signing. Those were two good signings. Those are like signings. I'm like, yeah, the Rays make those signings. And it's like, those are good moves. Right. But the 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 problem is it, like you said if they had a 125 million dollar payroll i guarantee you if they spent that much money they would blow out any other team they faced if they put up that ro- so let's say they have the 2020 roster then they get to spend 125 million dollars total in payroll uh not only would they be so much better than the yankees that i just probably would not even I, like i would not even consider the yankees a division contender at that point the race would be so much better than them uh the race would be a lot i think the race would be just as good as the dodgers arguably arguably just as good as the dodgers because they went to a game six with them and while they did have a couple a couple hitters overperform uh randy rosarena is a big uh proponent of that uh they also had some guys underperform meadows wasn't that good i know low struck Lau struggled in the postseason uh man uh, g man Choi was a little bit iffy in the regular season you know they're still you know they, they had they still have a, good, a solid roster they're not great uh but they had a, such a good team in 2020 had they just improved the roster would you be sitting here today and saying they're not they're not the division favorites or they're not the American League favorites? Yeah, I would. I'd still say the Yankees are better. I mean, it depends on how much they improve, right? Because last year, obviously, the Rays ended up with a better record. We had to consider that Tyler Wade started 50 games to the Yankees. Yeah. Uh, yeah and it was true. a 60 game season, and you did see some players sort of fluke out of nowhere and uh, they really shouldn't have, you know, on paper. Uh, so I probably, it really depends on how they, because they're not going to sign Bauer because they know the, the contract course. value is not worth it. They would have got Paxton though. George Springer. If they signed George Springer, I mean, I'd probably, and they still had Snell and they were able to bring back Morton and maybe they brought in a guy like Paxton, you know, th- then, then you're talking like it's like neck and neck. But, but I wouldn't I, even say that. I would say all that to do was, okay. So if, if they have Kiermaier in center. A Rosarena could probably, it's probably, if you can get out, go out and get a decent corner left, uh, corner outfield bat. Uh, however, you can do that. Hmm? 
They wanted Ozuna. Maybe they could have gotten. Oh, Ozuna. they could have gotten Ozuna. Maybe keep. Okay, so at that point, keep a Rosarina in left. You put Meadows in right. You have Kiermaier in center. You put uh, Ozuna at DH. You get a, cat, a capture like Flowers. You put him behind the dish. You have G Man Choi, Brandon Lau. Wander Franco comes up at some point. Uh, at third base, they do a platoon there. Wendell's solid, and Yandy Diaz is also solid. That platoon always works for them. And they got a guy like Paxton instead of bringing back more in because that get, makes it, that's a cheaper uh, alternative. Uh, and you have a rotation of Snell, Glassnow, Paxton. I'm assuming they still have Get Archer. Uh, and I'm assuming they still have McHugh, Hot Hill. I mean, are we really not talking about them being so much? I think at that point, they're a significantly better team than the Yankees. They're a significantly better team than everyone else in the American League. Or not, maybe not significantly better than the Yankees, under, but you're better than the Yankees. I think you're underrating the Yankees just a bit. Uh, it's a, yeah, I see what you're saying. I, you know I what I'm saying. Like they yeah. would still be because they because you would have to close at that point with statistical variance, what seven game gap, uh, maybe not an actual seven game gap, but you would have to close a gap there if the Rays get that much better because they would be improving drastically. I think more in and more into Paxton is a cost cutting move, but you're gonna get similar production. Um, oh, MLB advanced stats on Instagram, Matt. Do you think Charlie Morton's a top five pitcher in the? Braves are a top two team that continue. Well, I mean, okay, but it's it's similar production when you get when you're considering the money you're spending. Uh, because I know they want to just cut that salary. And I and I and I think there might be something underlying there, even though I do think Ward's a top 10 pitcher. Uh then you have Snell still, you have Glass now as well. Archer is a good is a good candidate to bounce back. McHugh is someone I'm really high on. He was really good in 2019, got injured in 2020, and then I think he just kind of opted out with the Red Sox. Uh yeah. and then Hill is always solid. Uh, and then you have those, you have a lot of young guys. You have, you have Yarbrough, you have all those guys. Your offense is going to be pretty good with, uh, Ozuna out there. And without and flowers is such a good defensive catcher. I mean, you give, you, you make, you give the Rays pitching staff, one of the best defensive catchers in baseball framing wise. I mean, the strikes you're going to steal with that elite. Yeah. That's scary. That's horrifying. Like that team would be so, so good. And it would also be able to keep these guys. This would be a long-term team. They have such a great farm system that, you know, every time we talk about, okay, someone gets hurt, they can just bring up one of their arms. That guy's going to come in, fill in a spot. Uh, McClanahan, I think, made a McClanahan, appearance. Yeah. His, yeah, he made his debut, Stan debut Lincoln in the postseason. Uh-huh. That was fun. No, it was on Curtis, I believe. John Curtis. They, they, he, no, he, he did it twice. Stan went deep in, like, every fucking game. <laughs> I didn't know he went off deep on McClanahan. That poor yep. kid. I can't even pronounce his last name right. Poor kid, though. McClanahan. But he's a good, he's a good pitcher. Um, yeah, he's good. Yeah, no, they would have all those arms, all that talent. They would at least be the American League favorites. Like, I think it would be fair to make them American League favorites. Yeah, that's fair. Like, uh, if they just spent money, and now they're not American League favorites. I don't even know if they're the best team, second best team in the AL East. I think that might, I you could have, push I that. The third best team. Yeah, and then you count on the AL Central. Uh, no, I said, um, uh, in the AL Central, you have the Twins and you have the White Sox there. Then you have the AL West, you have the Angels, Astros, and maybe Athletics. I don't know how good they're actually going to be. I mean, the Red Sox might be better than them. I mean, this is, they're now in the tier with the Red Sox, the Angels. That's not a good tier to be well, in. I think when you're the Angels are like really under, I don't, I didn't understand. I didn't know how many people underrated the Angels until yesterday's post when I got bombarded by people saying the Angels are not a top 10 team, which I think is crazy. And the Angels, even their offense, look at their offense alone. And that has like top, like the fucking top five potential. I mean, look at their their pitching. They're have you looked really at good team. Have you looked at? Do you remember the 2019 Red Sox? Probably one of the best lineups in baseball. A decent rotation, yeah, Angels, not terrible, but their bullpen was than, horrific. Angels 2020 pitching definitely better than 2019. 2019 Red Sox had literally nobody. They had like yeah, but why did that happen? Because everyone got hurt and Sna- well, yeah, Sale mean, got hurt. And yeah, do you trust Otani? You trust the, Bundy? I I trust Bundy. I trust uh, Heaney Haney. I, Haney I, gets I, hurt a lot. I love Haney. He gets I still, hurt a you know lot. What? I, I, I'm I'm not really obviously projections though. You're not really considering injury, right? Like, yeah. I'm okay. Not well, factoring an injury to anything. Yeah, I think that's fair. You, you can't really know, predict Jackson injuries. The, the R projections. I'm I'm looking when I do projections. I don't really care about because injuries are almost all the time kind of a. You fluke. can't predict them. You really you can't really predict can't. them. So yeah, when circumstance really dictates that. So I'm I'm surprised the English come become such an underrated team, even by their own fan base. Like I put them at seven and I made a note that they could be anywhere from seven to 10. I put them over the White Sox. I think it's pretty reasonable. Uh, I know uh, I'm a curious White Sox hater. They could easily, you know, it could be, I think they're, I put them on, you know, the same tier of play. You know, I, I'd have so, the first the top four teams is sort of that, or maybe I maybe have the top. No, I probably have the Dodgers is one tier. Yankees, Mets, Padres is another tier. And then I have teams five through 10, probably in that third tier range. But again, it, it, it's sort of like, 
it's hard to it's hard to obviously predict obviously you have your injuries and i'm not using yeah. a, a particular code and I, excuse me for the lighting it's uh, this lighting's not very good at the moment but uh if you're watching on on video but uh my, my main point here about that is the angels are underrated and it's because of injuries and, and what have you and they've been underperforming in the past and going into the season i think they're, they're gonna be better than the rays for sure i think they'll be better than the athletics for sure i think it's kind of a lock at this point i would say i don't honestly the I think are weird yeah. I don't bet obviously because that would be illegal. But for people who do bet, um, the Angels as a division winner is kind of a good bet. If the Astros get one injury, they, dude, the Astros, the, the Astros are probably like Astros plus five hundred. The Angels, I think they're like plus. It's like a good value. You know what I'm saying? You guys, we've talked about some kind of betting. You know, some some betting models recently, obviously. Um, so you, you look at the Angels, probably like plus five hundred, something like that. That's a good value bet. You know. I'm gonna go on a wild on a little bit of a, a not a little not a tangent. Excuse me, a little bit of a, a hot had, take. From, a hot take here. Okay. Okay. Fine. Okay. So, very similar to uh, what happened with in 2014 when we had uh, two wild card teams at the World Series. I don't think that's gonna happen. Uh, but here's what I think can happen. Okay. Okay. I think if the Dodgers. If something happens with the Dodgers, right, where and like anything, if the Dodgers do not get out of the NL, which I think is crazy, I think that would be like a massive wild upset, right? I, I think, I think if the Dodgers don't get out of the NL, right, I think the like the at that point the clear cut favorite, right, becomes either the Yankees. It becomes either the Yankees or Padres, right? You're down to those two favorites, right? Mm -hmm. Or the Mets and are in that team. Oh, the, the well, yeah, the Mets forgot about the for that. Uh, and uh, something happens to the Yankees injuries, stuff like that. Astros beating them for like the 15th time in the last decade. Uh, I mean, think of how crazy that would be if the Dodgers and Yankees both went out before the World Series. So now you have the Padres and the Mets in the NL, and then you have a wild scramble. Like, it would just be the Wild West in the American League. Like, who else is like, not who else is good? I mean, like, who would be your direct favorite after that? Well, who is it your direct favorite after but that? The playoffs are such a crapshoot at the end of the day. Um, so it, it's like uh, I, I'd probably consider the – who would I who would I say? The, you have the Yankees, and then I think I put the the Astros second. I'd probably consider the Astros as the favorite uh, for sure behind the Yankees. And then it's kind of a toss-up between you got the Blue Jays. You could even put the Rays. The Rays might sneak in as a wild-card team, and, you know, Randy Fluke-Arena might go ahead and uh, – do fluke again oh uh i wouldn't consider the red Sox in that tier at all i don't really like the red Sox as a team especially with their uh this uh the uh especially with uh sale not coming back for a while the twins are definitely a team i'm, I'm kind of forgetting about them but they're not good in the playoffs they might maybe the sneaking, world man. series you know i don't know i think the i, I think that the he whole thing with the white Sox is based on i think dylan cease is gonna be the big x factor here because dylan sees his are. Just like, his future value is at 50. I think it was on fan graphs, right? He, I mean, he was a decent prospect. He was a pretty solid prospect yeah, and he throws, doesn't he throw pretty hard as well? Pretty sure he does. He throws hard. I, he's kind of bad. So here's my thing. Okay. If he's like really Dylan bad. sees, if, if Dylan sees is a decent starting pitcher, just a decent starting pitcher. Cause I'm pretty sure they have a new pitching coach. He's pretty analytical. Um, White that could Sox be an analytical. No, no, no. They're pitching coach. That's not the, the pitching okay. coach is pretty analytical. Is he really? Pitching coach. Pitching coach. Yeah, he actually is. I think it's like Ethan Katz. Is he actually? Like yes. Are you sure yes. the White Sox? Are, are the yes. White Sox, it's not like yes. A, yes. 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 Like yes. 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 Operation the White Sox have of trying to tax their their arms and everyone's throwing nine innings and they have Tony Lu Dude, there. Tony Lewis was drunk and he hired an analytical guy. That happened. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, it's true. But in all seriousness. Yes. Uh, I, I mean, I think Dylan sees it could be a real X factor. I think he should have, like, I think the White Sox should have, at least consider if he's struggling in the rotation, at least move into the bullpen or something. Like, you really can't waste the guy who throws throw that sinkers? hard. Can somebody check that? One of our producers, he, I, please, God, tell me. Because if he throws sinkers, sinkers, then it's kind of an easy, easy fix. fix. Easy, not an easy fix. Like, what a solution, you know. But he could, I think he could at least be a decent. It appears James Johnson is checking for us. Does he throw sinkers, two seams? Yes. Uh, no, I'm checking. It's loading. Let's see. So his um, his his pitch mix is 48% four seam fastballs, 30% oh, sliders, 13% changeups, and 10% curveballs. No, so it, that's not good. happy. That's bad. So it, no, it, it makes bad. This is good. it no. makes no sense to good. me. Hear me out. White Sox oh, trade C how he's so and bad. And then he goes like off. Oh. That's what's gonna happen. Like he has really good stuff. He throws really hard and he has a good slider. I just don't understand how he's so bad. 
Is look at the pitch console. Like, where's his fastball usually located? Is on the upper part of the strike zone because that does definitely pitch matters. Bearing, yeah. Does he? Does he? Yeah. Pitch? So his fastball yeah. is in the top right. Oh, I can't share my screen. I would show you guys. Uh, it's in the top right uh, of the strike zone. How is uh, that good? The slider is like. The, I think his problem is he hangs a lot of change ups. Maybe our resident pitching guru, Jackson Del Rosario, can give can us explain it. No one's gonna say, yeah, why is he so bad? Why is he bad? Um, let's see. Well, he has a major walk problem. That, that's like that's yeah. the reason why he's bad. It's because he has absolutely a walk. crushed. Also, they should. So what's gonna happen? Well, is he gonna get does caught. He even, does he, he even strike guys out? What the fuck? He, no, he, he doesn't. Um, he I saw spin. something. His spin is really solid. Yeah, Dude, I saw something. He just turbos. nice. He uh he did not really good. He didn't see. He has good stuff. He just doesn't generate whiffs, which makes no sense. What's his pitch mirroring like? Mirroring. What's it I, like? I saw a, a little bit of a, po, a, a like a, a tweet. It was from one of uh, one of the white my White Sox mutuals. It was talking about like uh, expected something like uh, expected strikeout percentage or something like that. Where like the uh, what your strikeout should have, what your strikeout percentage should have been. And I'm pretty sure one of the biggest drastic differences, like one of the biggest underperformers in strikeout percentage, was Dylan Cease. I think Marquez was up there too. But uh, Dylan C should be striking out way more guys than he actually does based well, on where he locates his pitch. Well, it's yeah, he's sh- awful. It's, yeah, that's what I think I just realized. He's, he's going to get fixed. He's going to be a solid star. His team fastball team just gets crushed. crushed. So no, I, I, I just I, don't I understand how you can throw 100 miles per hour and, and average 6.8 strikeouts per nine. I know it's, a, I know I it's only know. a 58. Oh, I don't know what his like, approach angle is either, but if it's like if he's thrown in the wrong spots, because it looks like he's thrown up in the zone. So, I mean, that would make sense. Does he throw his curveball enough? these yeah, fastballs up in the zone because i know his curveball curve looks see it looks like he hangs a lot of breaking balls just based on that like his develop the curveball because his fastball you know rises well it's throws top fastball up curveball down sort of a pitching concept but I, I don't know if, I, I don't know if I, I really don't you know what i, I we're, we're sort of, what no, I, bro, all right I, we're sort that? of a bit sort of been on a bit of a tangent here and a bit of a ramble no idea we're talking about this interesting conversation but does anybody have any thoughts on good. Dylan Cease, the Rays, Tatis extension? Uh, I don't know. Anything we talked about. Anybody have any conclusions or final thoughts from this? Can Jamison Tyone please be healthy? I need to see a World Series, man. I'm going to cry if the Yankees don't make the World Series. I'm, like, actually going to cry. Like, if, if so, like, let's say we record the week after, like, the Yankees get eliminated in the playoffs and it's not in the World Series. I might actually cry on podcast. Like, I'm going to be so sad. I'm going to be depressed. on podcast. If, and hopefully there are more viewers to see that at this point. Because we like, what? I'm going to be so depressed. Episode, 60 viewers, press, something like that. I don't know. Uh, anyways, that concludes our first segment of today's podcast, which I really don't know how to classify as. There's going to be a lot of cool Instagram clips from all this, though. So stick around for that at Deep Drive Pod on uh, Instagram and Twitter. That's it for this part of the podcast. Moving on to the next segment of today's podcast, we're going to be talking about our top 10 first baseman. We do this in the last three podcasts. Everyone goes down their list. Hopefully, it'll be, more, be a bit more organized uh, relative to last time because more people are prepared. Uh, <clears throat> James? Anyways, uh, we'll be going down the list. I'll say my 10th. Ryan will say his 10th. James will say his 10th. Jackson will say his 10th and so on and then we'll have our combined list on twitter at deep drive pod go follow that mm-hmm. uh well let's do it uh at number 10 i have chicago white Sox first baseman jose Abreu. uh i have reese hoskins of the philadelphia Phillies. i also have the reigning al mickey mouse mvp jose Abreu. i have mr brandon belt of the san francisco Giants. At number nine, I have uh, Philadelphia Phillies first baseman Reese Hoskins. I also have I no, I don't also have him. I mean, I have Jose Abreu, also a winner of a Mickey Mouse MVP at number nine. I have New York Yankees first baseman Luke Voigt at number nine. I also have New York Yankees first baseman Luke Voigt at number nine. That makes me feel better if somebody who had Glaber Torres at six to say that. Anyways, <laughs> number eight, I have Kansas City Royals first baseman Carlos Santana. Uh, here's why I have Luke Voigt. I have Reese Hoskins at number eight. I have the polar bear, Pete Alonzo, at eight. Number seven, I have New York Mets first baseman, Pete Alonzo. Uh, I also have Pete Alonzo at I also have Pete Alonso at number seven. I got reigning MVP, Jose Abreu. 
at seven. Mm. At number six, I have New York Yankees first baseman Lucas Lewis, something like that. Voight. I think it's Lewis, but I could be wrong. Uh, Voight. Uh, Ryan. I have former love of Ryan Garcia, Carlos Santana at that spot. At number six, I have a member of the best team in the AL Central, Carlos Santana. I have a man who's not on the best team in the AL Central, Carlos Santana. At number five, I have uh, Chicago White Sox. Excuse me. Whoa, Chicago Cubs. Anthony Rizzo. I have future Chicago White Sox first baseman, Anthony Rizzo. No. I have Oakland Athletic strikeout king, Matt Olson. I have future Mariner, hopefully one day, Matt Olson. Evan White? And no. number four, I have Oakland Athletics better than Rizzo, whoever the fuck you want to put in front of him, Matt Olson. I have Matt Olson, future New York Yankee. I have Anthony Rizzo. Uh, who will be a Chicago Cub for his entire career. I have the better half of Rizzo, Anthony Rizzo. I don't know about all that. Uh, number three, I have Los Angeles Dodgers first baseman slash second baseman slash third baseman slash designated hitter slash probably catcher if he can do that at some point, Max Muncy. I have Max Muncy of the 2021 World Series champions. He's on the Yankees? I have Max <laughs> Muncy of the 2020 World Series champions. And I had Max Muncy too. At number two, World's I have St. Louis Fraudinals first baseman. So we all have Goldschmidt, right? And then we all Goldschmidt have Freeman three. at one. Yeah, I don't do this. Yeah. All right. I, I was, I was going to say. Why would you have? All right. So hold on. If you're going to have Olsen, if you're going to knock, I'm assuming you're knocking Void for people have Void at nine. I'm assuming you're knocking him for fielding, right? No. Fielding and volume. Uh, sample size. No, feeling. No, feeling. If you're knocking Void, I, I, I understood. If you're putting Void at nine, you're probably knocking. Well, uh, James said you're knocking him for fielding. So why Sample size. Is, so why are you putting Olsen uh, behind Rizzo if you're knocking Voight? Because I, Olsen's that's not my argument. That's no, not talking my argument. I, I, I don't think that's his no, argument. He's talking to me. It's, it's volume, right? He said fielding. It's volume said and field. Fielding, oh, fielding and volume, but volume. whatever. I don't really care. Voight, Voight has no volume. Like I'm he's really played. Not really caring about volume. He's, what played 166? But Ryan, how do you how do you Tatis is your best shortstop, but you have. It, and you don't care about volume there, but you care about it. Because there's a difference. Because Tatis is, like, by far and wa- – like, by such a significant margin, he's so much better than every other shortstop I had to put in one. Uh, other guy – there's a couple things. So, uh, that's actually a really good question. Uh, Voight got injured in 20 uh, – he got injured in 20 uh, – 19. 19? 19. 19 to the injury. Well, yeah, but that's yeah. – no, 2019. 2019, he got injured. Um, then in 2018, it was carried by a really hot streak. It was a small sample size of him performing well. We saw him regress in 2019, even though I think his ex but didn't drop way too much. Uh, and then in 2020, he played really well. I'm not taking that away from him. But there is something to be stated that he hasn't consistently, like, there's not a consistent streak of him being really good. And then again, he also isn't by far and wide the best first baseman in baseball. Like, we, I can't make the argument, you've never seen any of the shortstops uh, on that list post Fernando Tatis' numbers over 143 games. You've seen multiple first basemen on this list post extremely high uh, weighted run creative plus yeah. over that. Correa's I, never, Correa's never been a six win over 143 games. Yeah. 143. In 2016, he, he played. Uh, 26. That's 2016. No, you said never. I'm like 1945. Yeah, yeah, nev- no, no, but they, <laughs> but that's so the far seasons. They, yeah, no, no, tell me the last shortstop to post a 150 weighted runs created plus uh, from 2018 to 2020 at any point door over well, a 143 game stretch. Happen. That didn't happen. Lindor, over right? Game stretch. He didn't do, post a 150. Uh, oh, I thought you said 130. Never mind. No, 150. I wasn't really listening. 150. So, Anyways, that's kind of it. I don't really have anything else besides Jackson, but it's whatever. Okay, so a lot of them mind boy. And Alonzo, I have like just you can. I don't. I don't care about that. What's with Jose Abreu? Dude? Yeah, Abreu's really hot. He's has hot? been so. I, 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 so I love. I mean, I probably love just one MVP. Yeah, I moment here, but he just had such a. I, I mean, he had a really bad 2018, 2019, but his 2020 was unbelievable. And so there's. Wait, and but there's 2017 one thing. was really really good. So I'm I'm just projecting him to have like a better year than Alonzo and Boyd, which is pretty much why I put him. I saw That's some fair. stat 
I saw some stat out there that like he so the most produ- all, the most productive uh types of hits to have I think the wo- uh, based on the woba of that hit was like above 360 feet I think and he had like one of the highest percentage of balls hit over 360 feet so or something like that so he's like uh, his batted ball data is pretty uh like on 2020 based on 2020 uh that batted ball data is pretty uh sustainable not to that extreme but to an extreme where he can still be a good hitter like I I wouldn't put it but I wouldn't put it beneath a Brayu to be a mix like somewhere in between 2017 and 2020 and his 2018. So if he's like a 130 weighted runs created plus hitter, I mean Voigt yeah, would have right to be now. yeah. Like I, I think it's fair to I, I mean I would project Voigt to be better than that, but but I mean I, I I'm not that mad at it. Like the bottom of my uh, top 10 first baseman list, like I think like the seven through ten is so interchangeable. Like yeah, like a- after after Santana, like Alonzo Hoskins, Voight, Abreu, the same type of players. Belt, I I I was really close to putting Belt here. Uh, Votto, like I all those Belt's guys are very here. similar. Yeah, I think Belt and Votto are very similar. Our, our lists are basically the exact same, except Jackson decided to ruin it and put Brandon Bell at ten, and that's okay. <laughs> Otherwise, that's like, not that bad. Same players, no, it's not that like bad. we have the same ten you players, mean, right? Yeah. Wait, so who did he leave off then? Hoskins, right? Hoskins. Hoskins. Yeah. That's fair. Yeah, yeah I would cut him off too. That's fine. All right. Great list, everybody. Good job. Uh, does anybody make a combined thing or are we doing that for later, right? That's for later. Yeah. Be on also, Olsen's not a strikeout king. This Do it is on Twitter first. and maybe Instagram, depending on what okay. I can figure Make out. Make sure you go follow those. I don't really know how much we have to say here just because all our lists are basically identical. Olsen's we can talk strikeout, about how not Olsen strikeout. Strike out, strikes out 26% of the time that he, he walks that, that's out to the infla- plate. Time out. That's inflated so much by his 2020. Like, before that, it was before, below 25%. You, when we talk about strikeout kings, we're talking about guys like Judge, Stanton. Uh, we're talking about us. Uh, wait, I, mean, I, I don't know if Solaire is up well, there. Well, okay, but, but what, real, what you have to realize is when 30%. I'm calling him – when I'm calling him a strikeout king, I'm not saying like he's striking out every time. I'm just saying he's striking out twice as much as Rizzo, which is the reason why I want not the reason, one of the reasons why I put Rizzo ahead of him. Rizzo oh, I mean, also, I also did that, but to call him a strikeout king is kind of crazy. Wait, did you? Yeah, I put Rizzo. I no, no, I didn't. No, you're right. You're putting up Olsen above him. Well, you said Rizzo, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, I have like, Olsen above like, him. And, and Olsen's, Olsen's, a better. Better, Olsen's a better defender than Rizzo, but Rizzo's a better hitter than Olsen. And how much do we really count defense? Like, like it, it matters, obviously, but it's not as important as at other positions. And and it's not like Rizzo's a bad defender. He's still, a, you know, a slightly above average defender, especially for the position. Right. Uh, he, wins, he wins gold gloves every year that he doesn't deserve, but... Who won the gold glove last year for first baseman? AL. Rizzo. Ayo. Salvador Perez won Gold Glove with like a negative ten. <laughs> Ayo, Sa- Salvador Perez. Might oh, be Al like Al was uh, was it Evan White? I think might have been. Yeah, Evan, I, think, I, was trying to think. I feel like Gurriel. Evan White's a strikeout king, like bar none. There's not many higher. He's what forty one percent. Bro, Gallo, Gallo, White won the gold Gallo's ball. my king. I love that man. I love that he strikes out so much. And he has such a low batting average because everyone hates him. For yeah, that. Evan, Evan White did win the gold glove. And I have a feeling he'll win a couple more of those because he's, yeah, a, he's a very, very... But he just can't hit. Didn't he get extended in his minor league career? No. He did, right? Didn't They extended him, right? I feel like they did. Did you say no if you didn't know? <laughs> I, I thought, like, I, I don't know. I don't know. He hit in double A, though. Yeah, no, he got um, a six year, twenty four million. Yeah, contract. he's he's on a long deal with club That's options through twenty twenty eight. That's such Kevin a good White contract. Open, please, for Matt Olson, Matt Chapman. There's hey, no wait, way you could you uh, could get that. That kind of no, no. Uh, you have to put in like Noel Lee Marte, Juan Fenn, probably Neil Seager to someone too. Wow, he was not good offensively this year. Oh my god. No, <laughs> he, he was. He's, a striker, but he's okay. pretty horrible. Yeah, no, this might be one of the worst rookie years that you could have. But he, he did so on double A. I was surprised. They should they should go. I don't know why they I mean, I don't know why they rushed him that much because he, he's not ready, clearly. He's 24. Oh, he's, he's 24. Oh, that's that's not good. <laughs> that contract <laughs> might be not, that contract might not be that good, guys. Never mind. We're gonna have to he's gonna have to actually hit. So we don't have a cumulative list, but yeah, It'll be on Twitter you, and Instagram. But you can make your assumptions because all of us are the same. So Yeah, Luke Voigt's going to be the first one, obviously. Hopefully. Well, I think Jackson and I had him at nine. Jack had him nine. at six. I had him at eight. Insane. 
That's not right. right. Um, that kind of concludes this section of today's podcast. Uh, make sure to check out the list on our Twitter and Instagram. Maybe Instagram, but definitely Twitter at Deep Drive Pod. Follow those on and the relevant server. Uh, vibe, excuse me. Uh, it's on relevant also. Uh, Deep Drive Podcast. Go join the app, which is in the Emma Wiener's Instagram bio, and join the vibe. So that's cool. Uh, moving on to our next set of today's podcast, we have trivia. I'm winning by a lot, and Ryan is losing by a lot. Uh, I wrote down the score last time. I think time. I'm winning by like 20, which no, three, you remember, I remember, uh, three touchdowns. I'm, I'm up 35 to 35 to 14. Yeah. Uh, Ryan, <laughs> Sounds like a lot of poor Patriots, 28 to three, you know what I mean? Like, all right. They fine. do compare me to Tom Brady, yeah. you know? All right. Do you, compare me to the, you have any themes or? You Today's just... theme is MVP awards. Oh, great. Ooh. I'm going to, I'm so bad at this. Great. All right, Jack. What was the last team to win three MVP awards in a row? The team, you do not need the players. The team. Um, huh. Team. And this does not mean that the players were the same, but it could be. It could be. It could be. I think I know my answer, but um, it was not in the 2010s, I don't think. Um, What's the time limit on our questions? Just so I know, like, how long I have to think. Because I'd be sitting around just like saying the dumbest things while I'm thinking, like, uh, I don't know. Uh, what it is. There's no time limit, but if I feel like I'm, I feel like if I feel like you're wasting my time, then it's subjective. <laughs> I like it. I'm gonna say the Giants. Yeah, that's a good guess. Oh wait, did because, it Bonds and Kent go? Because they won that? five in a row. So somebody. Oh, but someone has oh, done it since easy. then. I mean, I so really that, that was the one where Kent and Bonds were when Kent won one, Bonds won one, Bonds won one, Bonds won one, or something like that. And then Bonds won another one. So yeah, they won from two thousand to two thousand four. But there has been someone to do it. Why you tell him? Because now he gets to know it's from two thousand. No, no, I know when it was though. Because well, I know everyone Kent knows that Bonds' Bonds's yeah, years know, were two thousand one to oh four. Did you not know Kent won an MVP? Whatever. No, I do know that. But what's oh, okay. The I was going to say. Uh, so then I got to think a little bit. But even I if he it's... didn't, they would have been an answer to this question. But yeah, no. It's but so... they're not the answer to this question because someone has done it since then. I really... 05. It can't be uh, from 05 to 07 because A Rod won one and no other Yankee won one in 05 and 06. It... In 08, 09, 010. I got to think. 010. Oh, 10. oh it's 2010. You know what I mean. Uh, I know Mauer won an okay, Mauer won an MVP, Posey won an MVP, but none of those guys had back to back years. Um, Trout never went back to back. Uh, he might have, but he never went back to back to back because he has three or four. He so 2012, 2013. No, he didn't win one. The Tigers, it was the Tigers, yeah, Verlander was. Cabrera. Yep, Verlander yeah. Cabrera's. I knew I was like, I was thinking 2012, 20, I was like, wait, that's Cabrera Cabrera 2011, that's Verlander. All right, 2011. Who won the 2011 National League MVP for Ryan? Oh, uh, Ryan Braun. That was easier than I thought. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of funny. That Your was question was pretty easy Braun. too, Jack. It you was. Oh, it wasn't. <laughs> no, it was easier to guess it if he guessed it first than it was. Because, like, I would have guessed – I was going to guess the Giants immediately. So, what, we're at 35-16? Okay. Okay, I'm still winning by a lot. Jack, oh. who was the last Oakland Athletic to win the MVP award? Um, I believe it was. Did he win one? All right, I'm thinking a while back because I know. Did he? I think he did win one, but was it with the? No, he won a Cy Young. I'm thinking the Leavers. Um. Oh no, Miguel Tejada. Yep. Uh yeah. Let's go. I remembered Moneyball. And I was yeah. thinking Eckersley and Fingers. Well, well, oh, it was Eckersley, and then there were more. It was like Eckersley, and Henderson then the Jack- what? Henderson had to have one there. So had to have one one there. So, uh, since since Eckersley won it in what, uh, nineteen seventy something. Since, okay, so Eckersley won it in ninety two. Henderson won it in ninety. Kinseka won it in eighty eight. But since then, Giambi won it in 2000, and Tejada won it oh, in I wonder, 2000, yeah, right? and 2002. All right, great. Oh, 02 was Tejada? Okay. Yeah, that was the money ball year. That's my bad. 
All right, Ryan, who was the last Houston Astro to win the NL MVP? Oh, I hate you for that. Because <laughs> I was going to say Altuve, and you're like, NL. I hate you. Okay. You said, you know, answer, whatever. Um, what? NL. What answer? NL. NL. Oh, no. But you see, like, oh, shoot. I don't remember if he won one with them. Well, I think I know uh, who this is. I, I think, think I, I know who it is. But I also don't think I know who it is. Was it like, Bagwell? Was... Yeah. Okay. Oh, I was gonna, I was gonna guess, guess Clemens. Oh, you you guys are on a roll today. I was, I was gonna, gonna get I was gonna guess Clemens. Mike after. All right, Jack. Here's your hard question. Question. The Cincinnati Reds won six MVPs in eight years between 1970 and 1977. Who won the others? And you only need one. I, there's two answers, but I'm I'm only gonna ask for one. Like you can get one or the other and Please? get the points. No, no, no. Players. The fucking player. How the fuck am I supposed to know that? 1970s i don't know any of that uh i i i guess uh i'll give you i'll give you both teams if you both want them yeah i want both teams that's not fair that's do you want fair. them don't be a, because don't be a ryan, ryan I, I i won't give them to you after if he guesses wrong so oh that's yeah, good yeah guess- but he's not gonna guess wrong okay fine but he's not gonna get it wrong i'm not gonna say no but because it's, it's up to him yeah. No, it's not up to him. It's up to what? you. Do you want me oh, to fine. say the go teams ahead. Just or go, not? Just do it, do it, do it. Because he's, he's okay. going to get it right. right. Go ahead. So one was – let me just make sure I'm not saying anything stupid. One was a St. Louis Cardinal, and one was a Los Angeles Dodger. So have fun because they have Mike a Mike Marshall? Marshall, did he win one? No. Fuck, I – at least um, not in this time period, but I. When did Mike Marshall pitch? Because I remember this couldn't. So this isn't the co MVP. This isn't within the co MVP year because that would have uh, been Pirates. Mike Cardinals. Marshall never won the MVP, but he did win a Cy Young award in this span. Was he like the first? Le- what? No, that was that was not the first lefty. That, like through two hundred fifty or something like innings. I don't know. Okay, you said what? The, you said Cardinals and pa- Dodgers, right? No. The yes. Cardinals and Padres. No, you said Cardinals and Dodgers. No, I said Dodgers. You said Padres. Said I said Padres. Asshole. Padres. Um, <laughs> <sighs> I don't know this one either. <laughs> I don't know who played. Um, ah, shoot. Um, was one of them... Did he ever win one? Was one of them Barry Larkin? In the 1970s? Oh, you said I don't know. I, it was it Smith, Smith or Larkin? First of, one all, of, those two first of all, Larkin played for the Reds, so he couldn't have been oh. the non-Red <laughs> to win that MVP. I don't know why he think he's a Cardinal. All right, well, that's um, was it Smith? Though. Was it Smith? Was it Aussie? No, it was Joe Torre. Oh, I wouldn't have gotten that. He got who was he's a Hall of Fame for being a player? I don't think he is. And one who who was a Cardinal? And then it was Steve Garvey. I, I, I could have. I should have guessed Tori, but I didn't guess Garvey. All right. Okay. That can so yeah. Go no, ahead. no, no, no. Ryan has a hard. Oh question. fuck! I forgot about that. All right. Okay. Go ahead. So, the first NL MVP was Frankie Frisch. Ooh, that's a nice name. What team did he play for, and what position did he play? I hate you. Uh, <laughs> uh can I get the? Uh, can I get the year? Uh, it was 1931, maybe. Yeah, 1931. You said Frankie Fish. Frisch. F R I S. Frisch. See, I was gonna ask what team he played for originally, but now I want both because I think that that would have been too easy. Yeah. Yeah, it probably would been too easy. Uh, but I'm not gonna get this one anyways. Uh, I'm gonna lay it up here. A little lay up here. I'm gonna lay it up and say, uh, Crystal Ball. National League. Okay. By the way, gonna gonna call upon. This lucky baseball here. Okay. And I'm going to ask it to tell me. It's going to do, I'm going to do something. Okay. If this ball lands on the signature, I'm going to guess this answer. If it doesn't land on that signature, I'm going to guess the other one. Okay. So I'm just going to. Well, you need a position it. too. So I know, but I'm going to, I can, but will you tell me if I get the team right? Like if I get it wrong, you'll just say I'm wrong, right? Maybe, maybe. I don't, I don't, know. I mean, for, I don't remember what, okay. I don't know what position you played for. So right. Okay. Right. Okay. No signature. So. It was the San Francisco Giants. No, San Francisco, not San Francisco, New York Giants. Well, it was not. Okay. But Frankie Frisch did play half his career as a New York Giant. Okay. It was, can I go? Yeah. Yep. St. Louis Cardinals. I knew yep. that. Now, I'm torn between uh, first base, second base, or catcher. 
do I like throw something up and fourth base? <laughs> Fuck, fourth I don't base. Know. Fourth base. Left bench. I mean, catcher, so That's maybe you're looking it up. Left I, I played left bench. I played left bench. <laughs> Fuck it. Do I go? All right. Fuck catcher. I don't think a catcher would have won it because they wouldn't have put up the same hitting stats. Right? You don't know that. You mean no, I don't. I have zero. Well, well, that's really offensive to catchers. Like, if I was a catcher and I was sitting right. at home, and I was well, saying, you're very much really offended about what you're saying. Base. I'm kind of leaning. Yoki Barrow won three MVPs in a row or something like yeah. that. I'm Keep- leaning first base, but I'm going to go. Well, maybe shorts. Dude, maybe all catchers out there. Where uh, do I go? Second base. You know what? Second base, Rogers Hornsby played for the Cardinals before. And second base, because Rogers sees that smile, it's it, it's second base. <laughs> Dude, I'm gonna go second base. How did you how did you get that? I got it because you smiled. Let's go. I knew it. Once I, saw well, you I mean smiling, he knew I it knew. anyways. No, I no, knew but it. I, no, smiling, I was, I was like, laughing because yeah, you because you, you said that ca- second base, I was like you said the catcher, you said the catcher wouldn't put up the offensive numbers to an MVP. In his nineteen in his nineteen thirty one MVP season, I guess Frankie Frisch had a 764 OPS, 101 OPS plus. I'm on baseball reference, so I don't have like all of that. But, yeah. what but he had a 311 batting average, which by the way, uh was not even close to the best season of his career, but he finished second in MVP voting in 1927. In 1931, you said? Apparently he's not the first MVP award winner. He's just the first one that shows up on MLB.com, all which makes no sense. Back. That's not fair. Well, oh, it's the I guess that's oh, right. I, I oh, guess that. oh, it's the first BBWAA. Oh, okay, that counts. That counts. Yeah, that's what MVP I mean, award I mean, winner. So many MVPs yeah. that matter because I'm the lead at trivia. Okay, oh, so it was who? Frankie Frisch. Frisch. Frankie Frisch. I'm really good at trivia, so that's all I'll say. How much am I winning by now, Ryan? You got you are up forty two to eighteen. Ryan, did I, did I short my lead? medium and hard. And I had 35. No, points. I did not. It's still. It's did I not- add this wrong? Oh, I gave two points for the medium, but they were. Three points. Give me all my points, sir. So it's oh. actually 43 to 19. How did he win NL? Because. 4.1. Yikes, Ryan. You got to. Well, know. it's because it was the first year that the BBW. The, uh, what, what, what do they call it? BBWAA. <laughs> Yeah. There we go. B- no, I think it's BW. Is it? No, B- it's it's BBWA. Baseball Writer. Writers Association, Association of, America. of America. Anyways, and that, that was the first. Whoa, whoa, whoa! That was the first time they voted, and they never get it right. So that makes sense. Even back then. Anyways, that concludes this portion of the portion of this podcast trivia. I uh, will post some extra trivia for you guys to to guess that we questions have been scrapped or whatever on our Instagram. So make sure to go follow that. Uh, and yeah, that's pretty much all we got for trivia today. That's going to do it for episode eight of the Deep Drive and Left Field podcast. Big thank you to Relevant for sponsoring today's podcast. Make sure to download, download their app uh, in the App Store or visit the link in my bio on Emily Leaner's Instagram. Uh, like I said before, you can follow me uh, on Instagram at Emily Leaner's if you don't already. Make sure to subscribe to Ryan's YouTube channel, Yankee Stat Talk, and follow him on Twitter at Ryan Garcia ESM. And we will see you in episode nine. It's for the Deep Drive and Left Field by Costianos. We are gone.